Hey everyone, welcome to Redefining HR Podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt, and today I'm really excited to be sitting down with the EEOC Commissioner, Keith Sonderling. We have a range of topics that we're going to be covering from AI to uh, paid family leave and so much more, uh, including uh, questions from you, the viewers in the audience who uh, shared some of your questions with me. And um, Keith, uh, before we get in, I'd love to have you just open with uh, an introduction. Yeah, well, Lars, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about our conversation um, today. It's been a real pleasure getting to, to know you and everything that you're working on from uh, from a transformative perspective of HR. But a little bit about me, uh, labor and employment law is all I've done my entire career. Uh, before moving to Washington, D.C. in 2017, I was a labor and employment lawyer in Florida where I defended uh, companies and dealt with both the litigation and the consulting side uh, for labor and employment. In 2017, I had the opportunity to uh, leave sunny South Florida to move to Washington, D.C. Uh, to join the uh, U.S. Department of Labor at the Wage and Hour Division. The Wage and Hour Division, uh, as most of UHR professionals know, uh, deals with uh, minimum wage, overtime, and of course, the Family Medical Leave Act. So leaving Florida, I decided to come to D.C. and what I thought would be is an opportunity to get a PhD in labor and employment law working for the Department of Labor, um, which was a really uh, great experience. And we were able to accomplish a lot there uh, with the overtime threshold, with updating the FMLA forms. And then in 2019, I was nominated uh, to be a commissioner on the EEOC. And I had to go through the full Senate confirmation process. And in September of 2020, uh, there was a full Senate vote on my nomination, and I was confirmed to be a, a commissioner. So since uh, September 3rd, 30th, 2020. I've been here at the EEOC. And as uh, most of you HR professional know, the EEOC is the regulating body for all civil rights uh, in the workplace. Yeah. Well, you know, going back to uh, your time as an employment uh, lawyer, you, you know, worked with the EEOC in a different capacity on the, on the other side of the table, so to speak. And I'm curious, you know, what were your impressions of the EEOC at that stage in your career? different than what it is now, actually. Uh, you know, at that point, I, I viewed it more as a federal law enforcement agency. And the, there's no question the EEOC and the Department of Labor are civil law enforcement agencies, if federal investigators, federal lawyers, um, and that bring very serious federal claims. So my initial experience from the EEOC was when a, uh, a company uh, had issues when a former employee or a current employee had brought a charge of discrimination. And it was, it was always from an investigative the defense standpoint. And that's how, unfortunately, a lot of lawyers and a lot of HR professionals see and know the EEOC as this very large law enforcement agency. But as you'll hear today, it's so much more than that. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit, because I think a lot of um, perceptions of the EEOC may be rooted in, in legacy perceptions. And obviously, uh, you're as commissioner, you're you're taking the organization, you're kind of putting your own uh, mark on the organization. Uh, how would you want HR practitioners today to view the EEOC? In a different light. And for everyone dealing with the EEOC, not just HR practitioners, but small business owners and anyone who has to interact, anyone who has uh, more than 15 employees where our jurisdiction starts, our mission is to prevent and remedy employment discrimination. The first word is prevent. And how do we deal with that? How do we do that? How do we give HR professionals all the tools they need to deal with these very, very complex federal laws? There's no question that employment laws are very complicated. And who are the people that need to, to actually administer these laws in companies? Whether it's a small company or a large company, you know, these, these laws need to be dissected in a way where business owners and HR professionals can understand them. And that's on us to do. And that is really how I view this agency's main mission is to prevent employment discrimination, and which is HR departments, one of their most critical functions in having those systems in place to prevent harassment, to prevent all kinds of discrimination. So what can we do from this perspective at the EEOC, knowing the law the best, having the ones to be actually enforcing it? What can, how do we take all that information we have and put it in digestible guidance for HR professionals, for small business owners, and for lawyers to actually understand that? And, you know, that really, for me, you know, I believe that enforcement alone is never enough to meet our agency's mission, that we need to do everything we can on the front end to know that we're an open door for companies 
who want to comply with the law, who want who want truly need the guidance and to understand the complex laws. And we need to do that. And that's on us. And then for the people who don't want to use those resources, which we have, then, you know, that's where the enforcement should be. But for, for HR uh, departments that want to comply and want to do the right thing, we need to be a partner with them. Yeah, and I'm curious, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, we talked about when we kind of scheduled this podcast is I really wanted to bring in members of my community to ask questions, um, people, you know, practitioners who are kind of on the front lines on a lot of these issues that we'll be discussing. And, you know, one of the first questions I want to bring from a community member, um, she asked about, uh, she's somebody who has underlying health conditions. Um, you know, in this environment of COVID, you know, she's not able to go into an office. Um, she actually lost a job. Um, for that reason, she is start looking for new roles, uh, but, you know, has to be 100% remote and is having a bit of a hard time in this environment in, in her in her discipline. And, you know, she asked, are, are there any plans for the EEOC to get involved with creating any kind of protections for employees in this demographic, people that may have underlying health conditions where, uh, you know, in, in this environment where COVID is still, um, you know, in, in, you know, out here, they're not able to go into an office. And so well, I'm curious, what response would you have for her? Yeah, well, this is a great question. And I just want to take a step back and talk about um, COVID. And it's hard not to start any discussion in HR without leading with COVID, which largely fell on HR departments in completely unchartered territories and never having dealt with this. And it was the same thing for the EEOC. And I really want to commend the EEOC here. And I want to show everyone this is an example when it came to COVID of a federal agency doing it right. A federal agency making very tough decisions for employers that normally would be very complicated legal analysis that we made early on to allow employers and allow HR departments to be creative in allowing employees to telework, in testing employees, and all the systems that were in place now um, largely came from very bold decisions the EEOC made early on. So when COVID happened in March 2020, the EEOC started putting out guidance right away, but guidance not in the, you know, your, your typical government, you know, paragraphs are long and legal. We did very easy question and answer guidance. And we told you when we updated them. And in that, we made very bold decisions, which I'll talk about in a moment. But on our website, and I know we'll provide the links to everything we're discussing today, um, we really broke it down into categories. So for you, all of you as HR professionals, no matter what the issue is, you can just go find it. For instance, we have a category in disability-related inquiries and medical exams, confidentiality of medical information, and issues related to hiring and onboarding during COVID, reasonable accommodations. We have uh, prevention tools for pandemic-related harassment. We talk about furloughs and layoffs and then eventual return to work. We talk about caregivers and family responsibilities, pregnancy, and obviously vaccinations. And we were really on the forefront of this. So when COVID first happened, the EUC made a very bold decision. And not to get too technical on the legal, under the Americans with Disability Act, the EEOC said that COVID was a direct threat under the Americans with Disability yeah. Act. That means just an issue that can't be remedied. The EEOC had never said that before in its history. The closest we ever got to pandemic-related guidance was in 2009, H1N1, which we put out a document, but obviously not as significant as COVID. But we never said that. Here we said that. So what did that allow HR professionals to do? Instead of having to do that individualized analysis for each employee throughout your entire organization, we blanket said, you know, it's a direct threat. Don't worry about that. So that's how employees were able to start taking temperature checks. That's how employee, employers were able to exclude employees from the workplace if they had symptoms that may be indicative of COVID that may not actually even have been COVID. When a lot, if you remember at the time, a lot of the local health authorities were asking for employers to disclose their employee, uh, COVID positive employees. You know, that would have violated uh, confidentiality of medical records. We carved out those exceptions to make them easier for you instead of before that. If we have, wouldn't have done that, HR professionals would have had to make an analysis every single employee if they should temperature check them, if that's legal. Um, because it wasn't before. So we told employers they're allowed to do things that they're not normally allowed to do. And I think that is what federal agencies should do. And I'm really proud of the EEOC. So I really encourage you to check out all that specific guidance. Related to your specific question, um, you know, COVID has, for HR professionals, it's, it's always one thing after the next. So the first thing was 
Do we allow everyone to telework? Can we exclude people from the workplace? Can we make employees take uh, temperature checks or COVID tests before having them back in the workplace? And then the vaccines came out. Can we mandate vaccines? Can we incentivize employees to get vaccines? You know, what about if an employee doesn't want a vaccine? So the EEOC has guidance on all that. It would take us two hours to go through all of it. Um, but, you know, we were at the forefront whenever these questions came up, we were putting out guidance telling you how you can incentivize employees, telling you how you can provide reasonable accommodations for religious accommodations, for disability accommodations. Um, but to your question now about issues with COVID long haul, we recently put out guidance on COVID long haul, and we really talked about how complicated this is for employers. Because two employees could have had COVID. One could have not even realized they had COVID and had no symptoms. Another one could have been on a ventilator for a, a month. And look, they're both former COVID um, patients. And how do you deal with that when they're both requesting the same accommodations, um, which may be telework, which may be something else? So our newest guidance really goes through um, how to deal with the newest issue, which is long haul COVID, and how to differentiate between employees who have permanent long term issues related to COVID, whether it's respiratory, whether it's brain fog, or all these new issues, and how to um, deal with that with their medical providers to give them long term accommodations, or how to deal with employees that have short term issues related to COVID that may go away because it's going to be different accommodations for each. So we really go through that. But to um, but to the, the question that was given to you, um, really employers, when there is a disability or if an employee can't return to work, you know, we go through in our guidance all these various kinds of accommodations that employers you know, must give under the Americans with Disability Act, depending on, of course, the reasonableness of the, the job they're doing and if it can be done remotely. So we talk about telework at length. We talk about modifying work schedules. We talk about moving the location of where one person performs or eliminating some parts of their positions or giving them, you know, protective gowns or, or um, the dividers now that you're seeing. So there's a whole host of ways HR professionals can look to the EEOC and give specific guidance on how to accommodate all of them. But the biggest one to directly answer this question is the issue of telework. And I know that's probably one of the hottest issues for HR professionals in the beginning and now is some companies want to return to work. And the telework analysis is complicated in the sense where the employer, you as, as HR, you control the essential functions of that employee's job. So because they've been able to perform productively at home, a lot of employees now are saying, well, we want to work from home forever. And, you know, that is a business decision for HR and management to make if, if they really need to be back in the office. But if employers want to recall every employee back to the office and HR says that's an essential function of your job, even though you performed well outside, the employer can do that. But then when it gets tricky is that, okay, if that person has an issue related to COVID that has a disability that has arisen since they going out, then you actually have to make some reasonable accommodations. So if, if the person, um, not giving any specific legal advice, of course, but if that, you know, if the person who, who wrote in um, has a issue related to COVID, you know, it's long haul COVID and there's been so many different symptoms. And again, on our website, I know I'm really plugging our COVID guidance hard because I really want to make sure HR professionals are relying on that so you can focus on other things. You know, it really uh, depends on that person and then telework might be the only accommodation that they can make for them, for them to continue their job if they can't come back to work because of a disability came from COVID. So a very long way of plugging our guidance, even though you asked me one question, I went through the whole COVID because I just think it's so important. And again, you don't need to make these decisions yourself. And this shows how the EEOC can be really helpful. And I really went through that guidance in depth because I want to show you, we can make those tough decisions for you because we should be doing that. So you can focus on the many other aspects of, of your business that you have to deal with. You know, I, I appreciate the depth because I think that, again, uh, we as, as practitioners are dealing with things we've never dealt before, right? There, there, there was no such thing as long COVID two years ago. Um, you know, there is no such thing around like needing to really, um, you know, uh, plan for uh, a sustained global pandemic, right? This isn't something that we've, you know, that current practitioners have really experienced before. So I think that that, that guidance is really helpful. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as, as you talk about uh, in your book and, and online about the open source HR and getting everyone's minds together, well, the EEOC needs to be a part of that too. 
And, and that's why, you know, getting this guidance out and talking about it and making sure that all HR professionals are also incorporating that, you know, there's a business component, obviously, that the EEOC doesn't deal with, but the, some of the underlying uh, law and decisions that I know HR professionals were struggling with early on and pulled together in large part because of the work you were doing, um, the EEOC should be a part of that equation too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because obviously the, uh, you know, the ESO is, is creating guidelines and structures and laws that we have to work within. And so I think, you know, I definitely want to come back to remote work because I think that's a whole new kind of complex area that we will, um, you know, as we build this new world of work, that will be a kind of fundamental component of it at a scale we've never experienced before. And right. so obviously I think that's going to be impacting, um, you know, how the EEOC looks at remote and structured work. But before we move on to that, remote I'll, harassment, which is, you know, potentially, yeah. unfortunately, maybe the future of harassment. But how do we get ahead of that now, to your point? Yeah, that, that's a great point. And it does even touch a, a bit on the next section, which I, I want to discuss with you a little bit, which is um, which is civil rights um, and kind of race in, in America. And I think that, you know, we're at a point, you know, following George Floyd's murder and some of the different kinds of conversations that we began happening in, in society and in HR from that. And obviously, this is a generational issue. This is our these are not conversations that began with that murder. But I, I think it, within the HR space, it, it did it did start to shift, I think, the way that practitioners um, began thinking about the role, specifically white practitioners. And, you know, I'm curious in this environment that we're in now, this, you know, everything seems very politically charged, but race, you know, feels like it's becoming a bit of a wedge issue in the U S whether it relates to voting rights, whether it relates to education, uh, and, and different, you know, state legislation that's coming that, that is, is really trying to drive that is a wedge issue. I'm curious to get your perspective. Do, do you expect to see any federal laws changing uh, around civil rights in the next, you know, uh, two to five years? Well, it is a great topic and it, and it does show that everything that HR practitioners are doing, similar to here at the EEOC, that becomes national news suddenly is put on all of our laps. So with the Me Too movement, um, which we'll talk about with, you know, the women's soccer team and pay equity, and now uh, post George Floyd, um, with the increase of racial diver of companies looking at their own racial diversities, HR and the EEOC are at the forefront of that. And, and, you know, in a way, national news dictates that. But for us, as practitioners and here at the EEOC, I believe that we have all the tools we need. The civil rights laws from the 1960s, which, which created um, Title VII and then many more laws from there, and created the EEOC... Those laws are as strong as and relevant as ever. And we have all the tools we, ha we need here, whether it's from uh, the investigative standpoint or whether it's the, from the penalty standpoint of the fines or of the money damages we issue in, in our cases to be able to prosecute, um, whether it's the Me Too movement or whether it's um, racial issues in the workplace. It, it doesn't matter. We have the tools. So I'm in the camp where I believe that you know, there's always this conversation about what new laws do we need? How do we get creative from a legislative perspective? And you see a lot of states doing that, right? Whether it's paid out of collection or transparency in uh, job postings. But from a federal perspective, as you know, because you live in this area, it's very difficult to get anything done. And, and relying on um, large scale changes to very controversial um, I don't want to say controversial laws, but it, it took a whole civil rights movement in the 60s to create the EEOC. And those laws with some additional ones like age discrimination, disability discrimination, pregnancy discrimination has been tacked on since. Um, I think we have all the tools we need. So, but how do we, again, how do we make sure that all these laws from the 1960s, 70s, and through 90s are being applied with equal force today to newer issues. You know, obviously with the Supreme Court decision in Bostock about LGBT discrimination, they, the law that they looked at was the law from the 1960s and, and with that uh, historic ruling saying that LGBT discrimination is covered under sex. So I'm in the camp where we don't need new laws, that we have everything we need. It's just how do we be at the forefront? And this really relies on HR professionals to continue to make sure that they're, that they're looking to the EEOC who's enforcing these laws, not only when something like the Me Too movement happens, not only something where um, everything with the George post-George Floyd's uh, death and the, the international looking at race um, diversity in the workforce, 
how do we how do we get ahead of that with our existing law? So it, it's a distraction for me in a sense because I'm in this seat and I'm uh, charged by Congress to administer and enforce the civil rights protections that are already there. So. I don't look at that, those proposals I, or anything else. If Obviously, if Congress changes the laws, we're duty bound to, to enforce whatever um, they say. The change is similar to the Supreme Court. But for me, we have all the tools we need. It's just let's break it down and let's get ahead of it. And, and let's, let's make sure that we're hearing from the HR community and, and working with the HR community to see what those trends are before we have to wait for something really bad to happen, like, you know, pay inequity, um, pay disparity, uh, you know, the Me Too movement. H how do we work together and, and have this ongoing conversation where, you know, this is what we're starting to see in the diversifying workforce. And the EEOC's job is saying, well, here's all laws from the 1960s. Here's how it applies to this new problems. And that's what I'm determined to do. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, even going back to your point uh, just before here on kind of online harassment, um, right, and discrimination uh, that may come about from some of these new uh, remote and distributed work constructs, right? It's like, you know, the internet wasn't a thing in the 60s when a lot of these laws were created, and now we're having to kind of figure out how we might, uh, you know, adapt them to these modern um, use cases and situations. So, um, yeah, interesting to, to kind of learn how you think about that. Exactly, and the same with what we'll talk about, artificial intelligence and my interest there. Um, before we get there, and why, you know, I'm really excited to be on your podcast and uh, hear from your audience, is that we don't know from, you know, we could see trends in cases that were that come in the door, but that takes an employee being discriminated against. That takes an employee not only being discriminated against, but moving forward and, and filing a case against their employer, we, you know, which obviously then becomes at some point a public forum and um, a lot of times requires uh, hiring a lawyer. And it's a, it's a big deal for an employer employee to do that, to make those accusations. That's how we get our a lot of our data. But you as HR professionals, you see it. You see a lot of things that that never come to the EEOC because you've resolved it or you've modified your um, programs or policies that are in place, preventing that issue at your one company. But how are we supposed to know that from the federal government's perspective outside of that employee coming to us, which again, our mission is to prevent that from happening, so that this ongoing dialogue that I want to have with the HR community is to spot those issues in advance, to see trends saying, you know, we're, this is what we're, we're talking about amongst ourselves in the future. And the EEOC, can you help us on the front end so we can then look to, to what you're saying from the federal government's perspective, who are, who, who are the experts in these laws, which apply to all of HR, and how can we work together on that? And, that? and that's something I'm also trying to change. So I need to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. Because I'd imagine for every every case that actually gets on your radar through litigation, there are dozens or more of cases that are That, that are, are being, never filed. That, yeah, exactly. That never come, or people don't even come to HR, which, which makes it even more difficult. But even if they do come to HR and say that one company just deals with it, how do we then bring prevent that from happening nationwide before it becomes a bigger issue um, for all companies and then on the federal level. Yeah. And I'm curious, do you have any kind of uh, almost like an early warning um, system where HR practitioners maybe who are dealing with some of these things in their workplaces or employees who are dealing with some of these work, you know, who may not be at a point of litigation, but want to kind of have some of these issues on your radar? Is, is there any mechanism in place yeah. for, for them to be able to do that? There's a few things. One uh, on our website, and again, I know we're going to talk about a lot of links. We have best practices for both uh, for businesses, and we also have for employees, too, on what how to understand what their employer's uh, obligations are for them and what their rights are. So we, we at least have on our website ways to spot those issues, and a lot of them have very clear examples uh, of past issues that we've seen. Um, but as far as spotting trends, it's, it's a little um, difficult. We have our yearly charge numbers that come in. So, but that again, to my point, is it requires actually somebody signing an affidavit coming to the EEOC and formally charging uh, discrimination against their former employer. So that's what we rely on, and you know we see trends in there. For instance, retaliation is the number one claim for the last five six years. Fifty five point eight percent of our charges, I think, are six. Um, alleged retaliation, because you know, obviously a lot of that is based on underlying discrimination and then retaliation is tagged on when they're complaining. But outside of retaliation, disability discrimination is the second highest discrimination every single year. So um, 
that that shows at least from what we're seeing and from that perspective, the harm's already done. We could put out more guidance and talk about it publicly like I do and say, you know, here's our guidance how to prevent retaliation. Here's our guidance how to help people who are disabled in the workforce um, or, you know, for age discrimination or sex discrimination. But again, that that is taking, that's post fact. So yeah. to, I, I don't know how we get there other than more dialogues and more conversations. We do have an 800 number where employees can call in in advance of um, filing a charge and making and, and have inquiries. And we get over 300,000 phone calls um, there a year. So certainly a lot of information, but again, a lot of it is very obviously confidential for those employees as well. So it's th there's that fine balance of being in the government where, you know, potentially some of this information may be helpful to a broader scope, but it's so individualized to that person. Yeah. Um, and Leslie, you know, I'd love to shift towards um, paid family leave, which I know, you know, EEOC is more of an enforcement agency. You're not kind of creating laws, you're enforcing laws. But, um, you know, the conversation around paid family leave um, and and the uh, how that is rolled out, and particularly as it relates even to paternity leave, um, how do you see those or do you see those laws changing in the next couple of years? Do you have any perspective on, on where you see that going? Well, this is a big push around the country. And obviously there's a lot of states, there's counties, but really employers, large corporations took the, the lead on this in absence of federal regulation. And, and that's a good thing. And employers are free to do that. Now, obviously some employers can and have the resources to do that, to implement um, paid uh, family leave, paid sick leave policies. Um, and that's on them. But from a federal perspective, you know, we saw significant changes in the federal government where just in the last, I think, two years, the federal government has a paid family leave program as well for federal employees. So obviously the, um, the shift has been going there, both from a federal perspective, from a state and local perspective and a corporate perspective. But from the EEOC's perspective, which is a little different here, which I have to explain because people, you know, it is within our world, but but actually requiring an employer to pay is would take legislation. Um, whatever the the programs are, they just have to be instituted fairly, and, and they can't be biased towards one gender, one race, one religion, um, and that's where the problems come in with any of these programs. And specifically to parental leave, we've seen significant discrimination. And I know it's been really brought to light in the HR community as of recent with um, fathers who want to take leave. And, you know, there, there's two parts of it. One, there's the societal that, you know, men don't need to take leave. That's uh, um, their, their wife's job or their partner's job. And that's not, that's just not, you know, there's a, there's a whole business reason. And I know that a lot have been talked about that in the HR community about having that, but there's a legal reason too, because, you know, title seven protects sex discrimination or, um, discriminati discrimination based on stereotypes. So we've seen a lot of corporate policies that have unequal treatment for fathers and mothers where mothers can get a full leave, whether it's paid or not, but actually are allowed to entitled to that where fathers get two weeks opposed to 12 weeks or, or no time at all or, or not paid versus paid. Um, it gets a little complicated as HR professionals know if the mother is, there's policies that allow uh, the birthing mother to recover from the actual pregnancy um, or, or if it was a complicated pregnancy, there's, there's different issues there. That's, that's a separate story. But what I'm raising awareness of, and we've seen some really large cases, both from the EEOC and the outside about large companies that are really discriminating against men and discriminating against fathers by offering unequal leave. And, you know, and that really goes into a whole other issue that has been raised by the pandemic, and that's related to caregiver discrimination. And, and look, that's fathers and, and mothers are also on the same playing field now with remote work and uh, caring for their child. So my point in all of this, whether or not we see a mandatory paid leave, it just has to be instituted equally um, for mothers and fathers. And fathers have the ability to take the, the same leave to care for their child as mothers. And surprisingly, it's still not the case. We see a lot of unequal policies there, and that just violates the law. Yeah. Well, again, I think uh, you know, as the um, societal perceptions of role, you know, gender roles as it relates to care caregivers seem to be shifting, thankfully, um, you know, again, I think that there are still a lot of companies that are very uneven in, in how they how they view leave um, for for mothers and fathers. And so, uh, you know, hopefully that as as our kind of perceptions of 
of parenting changes and, and kind of gender roles change, then the companies will be able to keep up with that. But it's good to know that there's a, uh, uh, equal enforcement um, wing as well to be able to to support that if if uh, if parents and fathers are feeling like their their employees are not employers are not supporting them. Um, let's. I want to kind of shift on to AI. I know this is a topic that you're you're really passionate. About. I have a lot of questions you know for you in this area, but I want to just start with the general one. Um, you know, AI is still a fairly nascent uh, technology in HR, and we're using it for a variety of use cases. Um, at a general level. What guidance does the EEOC give uh, companies on using AI as a tool in you know, hiring and or HR broadly? Well, right now, there's really no guidance anywhere across the board when it comes to artificial intelligence. And when artificial intelligence in HR versus artificial intelligence in business is, you know, it's being used in large companies across the board. And you know, we don't need to go through all the statistics, how dominant it is and how much money is going to the industry. So that's really why I've been trying to raise awareness of this, because I think this is an area to, you know, where we started the conversation that the EEOC can get ahead of something. The federal government can actually get ahead of something um, before it's completely widespread, although it is, you know, really being used significantly in, in large companies now with everything post uh, related to the pandemic and hiring, which we'll get into. But this is an example of where, you know, with HR technology and HR management systems, as, as you all know, they're, they're really, um, there's a lot of money going to that and companies are really um, starting to use them at mass scale, which is a good thing. We want technology, we want companies to, to make the part of their lives easier and more productive um, by having technology to ultimately help them as HR professionals and help their workforce. The, the issue is because it's so new, um, no, nobody has put out guidance or practices or really talked about that. And that's what I'm trying to do early on so the technology can be developed in a way that complies with civil rights laws and that the employer who is ultimately liable for any decisions that it's make has some best practices, not only when they're buying the software um, to ask the vendors, but when they're implementing it in themselves too to prevent potential dis um, discrimination from this. So it, it's, employers are in a difficult place right now because this technology is coming into their companies and they don't necessarily have the guardrails that they've been asking for. Yeah, and, and how do you think about that? I mean, from a liability standpoint, uh, if if uh, an HR leader brings in an AI tool into the organization, um, they you know they might not have the guidance around how to properly configure it so that it doesn't create discriminatory outcomes, uh, and it does do that. It does create. And there's been some lawsuits around this where you know AI tools have created discriminatory out outcomes. Where does liability sit between you know you mentioned kind of the company is responsible, but what is the vendor's role in that? Well, under our laws at the EEOC, the employer is liable for the employment decision. Yep. The employment placement company, the employer, or a union. That's what our jurisdiction covers. The issue of when, whether these vendors who are creating these AI softwares and, and, and some large companies are just creating it themselves as well, you know, that really has not been dealt with because the, the technology is so new. But from our perspective where we sit today, the, any decision that the, uh, the AI tool makes um, is ultimately the responsibility of the employer. So that's where what I said earlier, it's just that is really on us to tell the employer not what they should be buying, right? Because it's a free country. Every, if everyone wants to buy uh, technology and do whatever they want with it uh, for business purposes, that's fine. But if it discriminates, um, that's another thing. So for us, we can for us to tell employers, here's what you need to be looking at when you're looking at the software, here's the questions you should be asking, and then here's what you need to do to implement them, I really think will help the vendors in a way. And the vendors have been you know, really reaching out to me and been really um, truly uh, passionate about their products and, and want it to work. And they don't want it to discriminate because they're selling these products to help companies diversify their workforce, to help companies upskill their workforce, to help companies make sure that the workers are in their right jobs and have fulfilling careers, which is great. I mean, that's the whole goal of HR, and especially with the, the future of AI, uh, HR and the workplace experience. These softwares can genuinely not only help current employees, but help applicants not only get in the door when they were previously limited getting the door by their race, their gender, their national origin, or their religion, by completely masking all that and just looking at, you know, their actual skills. Or even programs that, you know, forget a resume, we're going to make you do... Um, 
go through this uh, test or analysis or play these games, and then we're going to tell you where you would fit best in our company. That's a great thing. That really helps the work experience. That is the future of HR, and it's going there whether it's digital or not. And I, I know this is you know what you talk and write about. So. I want this technology to flourish, and I want it to, but I, it needs to be used properly. And I think the vendors, if the EEOC speaks about this, they're obviously going to want to comply. And again, that's on us. So we have this other unique group now where in AI, you know, normally we're talking to employees and employers. Now we're talking to uh, HR, of course, who's buying this, and employees who are being subject to this technology. But now we're talking to these computer scientists and mathematicians and statisticians developing these programs and, and informing them on civil, about civil rights laws when they're building these computer products, which they don't need to be cognizant of when they're building AI uh, or ordering robots to, to do the actual work. So that's on us. And um, I, that's why I tried to take up this charge here and because we can be proactive here. And that's unique, opposed to our previous conversation of reacting to really bad things happening. And I think that's what yeah. we can do in the technology space. Well, I think you know that this. Uh, you have a very interesting role, and the EEOC has a very interesting uh, role. And I'll put challenging on there as well. As you know, in these times where I think when you look at the field of HR over the last two plus years, you know we've accelerated five, 10 years in terms of, of our practices, right? Things that, you know, companies uh, expected begin the be beginning of the pandemic that they would take, you know, on average 410 days to shift to remote. They did it in 10, right? Uh, right. So all, all these things that were once perceived as, you know, what we once called the future of work, you know, uh, the future of work is yesterday. Like, what are we building now? And I think when you're having to respond to, again, you know, AI is just a, a large use case, um, but also things like um, remote work. Right. And the fact that, um, you know, many companies who had employees who were successfully able to, to work remotely during the pandemic are at some level hybrid by default, if not fully distributed. And so how do you think about kind of getting you, you, you help me understand kind of how you're thinking about getting ahead of uh, from an AI perspective. But this new shift towards remote work where, you know, many companies are at a minimum hybrid, if not fully distributed. How do you how, what is the EEOC's role in kind of adapting some of your uh, you know, laws or approaches for these new hybrid and distributed workforces. Yeah, and this is, this is a really great point. And again, it goes back to our laws from the 1960s. When, our, when the civil rights laws were passed in the 1960s, nobody at the time thought everyone would be working home and every meeting would happen from Zoom, right? You know, for sexual harassment um, claims, those were actually having people in person for the most part, you know, being either uh, verbally assaulted or actually touched. And now what happens when it's all online and it's all digital? But that's the wonderful thing about these laws is that we just have to keep applying um, these time-tested civil rights laws um, to, to the new issues and whatever it is. And now it, it's remote work. So from a remote work perspective, and I, and I, I read everything that you as all HR professionals read about all this stuff, not only how you had to implement it quickly, but also the benefits and then the workplace experience and how um, happy workers are and, you know, people don't uh, necessarily want to go back in some places. Um, I get that from a perspective, but let's talk about now that something companies face. What about if an employee um, can't work remotely? Yeah. What happens if you're in a manufacturing line? or in agriculture. Um, you know, so it is not universally applicable. So all these wonderful st stats we're hearing, it, it's tough for certain industries who, who would want to be very progressive for uh, HR leaders in those groups, but they actually need to be in a plant, right? Or right. they need to be somewhere. So, you know, from my perspective too, we regulate every industry <laughs> here. So a, a lot of this is dealing, you know, with, with the corporate perspective of saying like, you can work, you know, a lawyer accountant, you could work from the beach or you can work in our skyscraper in New York city where we're paying a lot of money for rent. Um, that is one thing, but who's getting the opportunities for this? And as we're seeing in statistics, and again, this is not for me, this is from uh, major newspapers that, you know, the vast majority of these um, workers who, who are eligible for uh, telework are not necessarily um, minorities or not, not, it breaks down on certain age, gender and, and race characteristics, national origin. Um, so companies have to keep that in mind. When, when they're shifting to remote and when they're, who's getting those opportunities. So when certain groups are getting these opportunities saying, you know what, this group, you can never come back to the office, go live wherever you want. But this group, you know, you need to come back three days a week. 
And th that may be a whole host for reasons. There may be legitimate business reasons for that. But from an EEOC's perspective, what is the breakdown of that? Are, are, are all workers over 40, which is the Age Discrimination Act, um, have to come in while, uh, you know, the Gen Z workers, but the type of work they're, they're doing and the type of work they're applying to can work remotely? You know, are you setting yourself up for the age, an age discrimination claim there or a gender claim? So you have to be mindful just with all of these, you know, forget the harassment for a minute, just the basic, you know, discriminatory outcomes of some of these um, new future of work, work experience, um, whatever the new terms are. How is that going to affect people of protected classes? How is that going to affect older workers? How is that going to affect women? How is that going to affect, you know, potentially caregivers, male or female? So a lot of that dynamic just needs to be in place. And, and, and that's what I'm trying to raise awareness of, especially when it comes to um, the whole now push for learning, for upskilling, where employees now, they don't want to just do one job their whole career. And they're relying on employers to provide them learning software and to teach them who's getting those opportunities. And, and just we need to make sure that it, it's not based or, or the results of that don't show um, it's being discriminated against one group. And that's uh, against one group. And that's what I really want HR professionals to be mindful of when you're designing these programs, to engage talent, to um, help your current talent, when you're making these decisions, just look at the demographics, look who it's affecting. And um, Keith, I want to come back to one more community question uh, as well, and it's regarding the uh, federal self-ID forms. Um, are there any plans to adapt and evolve those? I think those were you know, designed obviously years ago, and I think the kind of uh, information that HR practitioners and companies want to capture, especially, especially as it relates to creating more equitable workplaces, uh, would be around you know employees who may identify as non-binary, uh, employees who may identify uh, as more than one uh, race or ethnicity. And I'm curious, are there any plans to kind of adapt and evolve um, the, those federal forms so that HR teams can get more granular in the data to hold themselves accountable. And this is a, a really a, a top question, you know, I get often from HR professionals. So whether it's in applications or whether it's in, in HR forms, companies now are having um, non-binary options instead of just male and female. And the reporting to the EEOC that companies with more than 100 employees have had to do since 1966 on our EEO1 data, which I think is where this question is going to, does not have those, you know, it has the, the male or female, it does not have the non-binary genders in the federal forms. Now there's two parts to this. One is the um, Washington DC answer to this, that to actually change um, federal forms, um, there's complicated laws like the Paperwork Reduction Act, and I, again, I disclaim that it's a DC part, of, that would have to happen um, for us to be able to change these forms, which triggers a lot of potential comment. It, it just, I don't want to say it's a lot of work, but there's a lot of uh, hoops that needs to be go, to go through to do that. And I'm not saying that may not eventually happen, but right now, you know, that's really out of our, my control. But in 2019, the EEOC on our website, we did have a question and answer about this. And we did start talking about this on how um, HR departments can report that non-binary information to the EEOC. But it's not that, of, it's not as simple as what Lot, most large companies are doing, we're having those drop down boxes on the applications where you actually are collecting that information. So there is a process of that. We have a question and answer of that, which I'll, I'll provide um, to you. But the, the EEOC officially, you know, through a spokesperson, when asked about this in, a, in an article last year, basically said that it's continuing to explore ways to collect expanded gender data on our form. So again, that, that, that was passed and that was the official statement from the EEOC. Um, so it's something on the top of our minds, we were hearing about it and we know for HR professionals, you have that data and you're willing to disclose that data. I think that's the whole point of this is that HR departments are taking in that data and they have this uh, useful information. They want to give it to the federal government. So um, stay tuned, uh, but we will get you, uh, make sure you have that answer to how, if HR departments want to submit it now, there, there's a, a way to do it. Um, and Keith, I'm curious, you know, every every commissioner uh, of the EEOC will kind of leave their own mark on, on the organization. You know, when your term is up, how do you want to be remembered as commissioner? I want to be remembered as a commissioner that uh, really got ahead of issues, that really prevented large scale discrimination from happening, from reaching out and working with the HR community and not being reactive. 
And I believe in that sense very much meets what the EEOC's mission is and meets what my role is here. Um, and, and that's not necessarily uh, enforcement first for me. It's let's get all the information we can from HR professionals who are dealing with this every single day across the country, across regions, across industry who, who actually have the best knowledge about not only what's going on now, but what is, what's coming down and what's coming in the future. And taking that information, we can all work together and get ahead of that to prevent the Me Too movement from happening. So if these claims start popping up, you know you've worked or told the EEOC and you know the EEOC has addressed that. So I wanna be as proactive as I can, um, which is why I appreciate you very much having me on this podcast and working with the HR community and, and really being a commissioner that, that made the bridge from the, from the EEOC to the HR community. And I think that's a very important, and I don't, and I want to be one, one leading that charge. Well, Keith, I really appreciate you making time to come on the podcast, um, helping listeners and viewers better understand kind of your vision for the EEOC and how you can be supporting uh, HR leaders and practitioners. You, you referenced a lot of materials and links. Uh, we're going to load the show notes up. Um, for this episode uh, with all of those links. So uh, if you are listening, uh, be sure to visit the uh, AmplifiedTalent.com site uh, and visit the podcast section there so you can get all the links to uh, all the resources we discussed. And um, Keith, we wrap up every episode with a lightning round to help the uh, audience get to know you a little bit better. So uh, I'm going to jump right in and, and I'm checking out your, your Spotify playlist, your top artists. Uh, who will I learn are the... Uh, three artists who are on heavy rotation for you. The whoever sings Wheels on the Bus, because that is what <laughs> we're playing for our uh, infant son on Spotify. So it's a lot of uh, baby music and lullabies to put him to sleep. So I have to say right now that it is all baby music, but that's the time of my life for that. <laughs> I can appreciate that. I, I should still have a, a white noise uh, playlist. White noise that, uh, and we created the from those moments. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, let's shift over to, uh, to TV. Uh, what was your, your latest binge? So I actually went back and watched every Seinfeld episode from start to finish and Curb Your Enthusiasm episode from start to finish in 2021. So that was like a big life accomplishment for me to watch them all in order, every Seinfeld. And then right when Seinfeld ended, moved to Curb Your Enthusiasm. So I, I think that that was an impressive binge. <laughs> That it is, it uh, took a good part is, of the year, but it was worth that's it. That's a lot of Larry David. Yes. I, I, but I applaud yeah. that. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge curve. I mean, how could you not be a curve? Right, but so. you know, even watching Seinfeld going back, it really helps you understand life to... to even today, it's just so relevant and it's everything with Curb Your Enthusiasm. So it's a worthy binge. It takes a long time, but I would encourage you to watch, to stack them both. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna shift your career. Uh, obviously, uh, you know you're you you can you cannot say EEOC commissioner because you're in that seat today. You can't say uh, a lawyer or attorney because you've been in that role in the past. If you were doing something different, what would it be? Jeez, I think either um, one of two things. One, I uh, I majored in television and radio at the University of Florida. And I know that is an issue you and I have of, uh, <laughs> of being in opposing rival schools. But I always wanted to be the uh, an anchor on the like 4 a.m. morning shift, you know, like the peppy wake up in the morning. Um, so I, I, I would that would was be, that I would do that if I wasn't doing any of this and really um, wake up at uh, one in the morning to get everyone up at four in the morning and be that very peppy person that everyone just shuts the volume down and turns the TV off. So. <laughs> You know, there are a few, very few acres, I think, who would actually be uh, clamoring for that seat. I know. So, uh, so maybe I'll think, do that. Uh, <laughs> you, that, that. you know, I think that future is open yeah. to you, actually. Um, and then, you know, I know in your role, you've, you've, you've worked with a lot of different HR leaders. You've worked with business leaders. I'm curious, do, do if you had to kind of uh, point to one HR leader who you admire the work that they're doing, um, who would that be and why? Well, I can't answer that question because I can't endorse any company or individual. I do have, uh, I'll give you a political answer because again, we're in DC that I respect yes. all HR professionals and all companies <laughs> who want to comply with the law. So, but in all seriousness, I really got to um, the uh, the people analytics community in specific. Since I've got into uh, AI, I've really started to get to, to know them across the board. Uh, and then all the, the new programs that are in, uh, whether it's uh, NYU or Wharton, have that have these people analytic programs. I really think that is a um, an area of HR that is really fascinating 
And, and I, I know as HR leaders, you're either in people analytics, it's on your portfolio now, or you have teams that are in people analytics. But I think that is, is just a such a uh, emerging area when it comes to human resources. And it brings such a, a different background into HR that's very relevant into HR. So the, the people analytics community uh, is one that I've really been uh, recently talking with and, and focusing on. So uh, I've become aware of that. So, but, but I love all HR at all... Uh, across the board, as long as they're complying with the law. <laughs> you know, that's fair. I should have known that I couldn't put you on the spot to, uh, to, to name a particular practitioner. So I, I appreciate the interest in uh, uh, shouting out all HR leaders and uh, giving a little plug for people analytics. Um, Keith, I really appreciate you making time to come on the show. Um, thanks for your outreach. Thanks for the work you're doing to connect more deeply with the HR community. And um, yeah, looking forward to, to seeing uh, how you continue to uh, grow with the outreach and um, considering to see how we can help inform uh, your approach to kind of, again, let you uh, get you access to some of the data and trends uh, before they reach a litigation standpoint so you know uh, what's on our radar. Yeah, and that's my final plea. Just please keep in touch. And, uh, you know, I have an open door. You can follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter um, or, or reach out. Um, just let me know what issues you're facing and what hard decisions we can make for you so you can really then focus on the workplace experience and some of the other things that I know that are top of mind for HR professionals. Great. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, thanks again for all your work. Thank you.